ahead. Yep, thank you, Kevin, for recording. Um, I will go ahead and share screen for just a second. Okay, so welcome to CFAIL 2021. This is the third iteration of this conference. So just for those of you who may not have joined one of our previous events, uh, here's a little brief history. Uh, we launched in 2019, um, back in the olden times when we had an in-person event at Columbia University. Uh, if, if you want, you can check out our highlight reel from our PowerPoint karaoke duel to get a sense of the kind of things we like to do and we're able to be in person again. Um, we also uh, made one major mistake, which was our original website had 2019 in the domain mate. Uh, that was not very forward thinking, so we fixed that. Don't go to the old name, by the way, big mistake. <laughs> Checked it out yesterday, not a place you wanna be. Um, so in 2020, we uh, relaunched as an affiliated workshop for crypto. Um, we went virtual at a more sustainable uh, web address, which you can find all the information about past events and future events at cfield.org. Iron Man, Iron Man even stopped by last year, so who knows what might be what might be coming today. Um, 2021, you're here, so you know where you are, presumably. We've got some great talks and some fun stuff planned for you. Um, in between the sessions, I'm going to have some trivia questions playing in a slideshow um, on, on the background of the Zoom um, in the Zoom room, so feel free to stop by and take, and take a look at those or come a little early, et cetera. Um, and also, we'll be back for 2022 in some form, virtual, in, in person, affiliated, not affiliated, some form of CFIL will be back. We're figuring it out. Uh, so go ahead and start failing now and get your get your talks ready for next year. There's plenty of time, but you want to be careful because you know the first few times you might accidentally succeed. So you want to make sure you know you have you have enough time to get those failures in. So think about that. Um, and just a quick rundown on today's program. We've got two quick back-to-back -back sessions for you here. The first session is gonna have uh, two, two talks, each about half an hour. And some of that time will be a uh, pre-recorded video talk that I'll play. And then some of that time will be for um, Q and A with the authors. And then we're gonna have a uh, invited keynote um, for, for the second session. So that's going to start at around 11.15. From noon to two uh, in California time, we're going to take a long break. And part of the motivation for that is to you know, give you a break from Zoom. But also that's when the panel is going to be hap or one of the panels is going to be happening for the mentoring workshop. So feel free to go and check that out. We try to make it possible um, for you to hit both of those things. And then we'll be back for uh, another two sessions then starting at two o'clock with a 15 minute break in between. And so that is all that I had for the intro. So I'll pass it over to our program chair. Thank you. I actually don't have much to add, except that it's great to see the attendance here. So, and to thank everybody for coming and that we have a great program that you've just seen. And I think it is customary for the program chair to give some statistics. Um, the numbers are actually too small to have something meaningful, but still, um, though we got this year nine submissions, which is a whooping 180% increase from last year. And of these, we accepted six papers. Um, and for the first time this year, we partnered with the computer journal in order to encourage people to make submissions. Some of the accepted papers um, will be invited for, uh, to submit a full paper subject to a second round of reviews to the computer journal. So out of the six accepted papers, four will be forwarded to the journal. Um, and I think uh, at this point, I don't have anything more to say. So I'll just give the floor to Tanya, which is the chair for the first session. Um, I hope you enjoy the program today. All right, now we get serious here. So the papers which have not failed to get into the program, it's always interesting to see that people can fail at CFIRE. Um, so the papers that um, we're gonna see today, the first one, I guess I got the challenge of speaking French here. Um, let me also say a moment that we have, that of course there is a Zoom chat, but I prefer people asking questions for the authors 
uh, on Zulip. So I have a different screen here, which I'm looking at when you see me looking down. Um, that's the Zulip chat. So please ask your questions there. If you end up asking on Zoom, I will not forcefully ignore you, but I prefer ignoring you there. So, and sure enough, there is now, oh, it's, it's just, thanks Kelly. Uh, thanks Kay for uh, putting in the, the, the link to the Zoom, uh, to the Zulip. So, okay, so the first talk, um, I know how to pull out my French, is uh, En nom, quel malheur, standard techniques fail for prime order petit IBE. Uh, by Vanessa Daza, Zara uh, Fernando, Carla Raffles, and Javier Silva. And I understand that this talk is going to be by video. So now we're going to see the technology fail. I'm working on it. Let's see if I can get this right on the first try. There is the media player. Can people see that? Everyone, my name is Cara Raffles and I want to tell you about joint work. Let me pause for just a sec to ask, can people hear that? Yes. We do okay. hear, but- uh, A little will, louder. Oh, I will say that the um, the Zoom uh, bar across the top is blocking part of the video. Okay, great. I will get rid of that in just a sec. Is the volume good? Yes, for okay. me. Okay. All right, thank you. Pues Vanessa Dafa, Faira Pindado, and Javier Silva from Universidad Pompeu Fabra, Barcelona. The title of the talk is Oh No, <laughs> Quel Malheur. Standard techniques fail for the prime order petit evil. Or a very sad story about how long time ago linear algebra painfully enlightened us and we gave up hope on ever solving a problem. And now for the first time, we feel capable of telling you all about it. So listen carefully. The problem. Like all good work, we started with a promise. The promise that behind the mountains, there is a land of sunshine. So if we managed to solve this challenging task, we would get a very nice result. In particular, in this case, we started with uh, the work of we, whom at TCC 2016 presented an IBE in composite order bilinear groups with very nice features, namely very simple, um, efficient, meaning short cipher tests and keys, and secure under standard assumptions, um, meaning that the assumptions in particular were independent of the number of secret keys queries made by the adversary. Also, it was anonymous, which is a very nice extra feature in some applications. Unfortunately, composite order bilinear groups are inherently inefficient, so we also presented a prime order translation of this scheme with the same nice features. But he couldn't find a security proof. Mm. The key open question that he left open is when does a certain complex form of a property called parameter hiding take place? And unfortunately, in this talk, we're going to give you very sad news. So we climbed the mountains, we solved the challenge to find only barren land. We characterized the cases in which parameter hiding solved and holes, and we show that, in fact, it's quite unlikely that the prime order petite either can be proven secure under standard assumptions. More generally, we have even worse news. We think that the Deja Q framework of Chase and Makeljohn, which um, seems to be who's like is the main technique behind the composite order building um, scheme of we seems too hard to use in the prime order setting. So I will stop crying and try to tell you some more details about it. I will start with proof techniques for identity-based encryption. First, very quickly, since I think you all know this, what is identity-based encryption? Well, it's a form of encryption where public keys can be arbitrary strings. So why is this useful? Well, this is useful because the public keys can be said to be some certain aspect of the user's identities um, and this achieves um, implicit certification. So a user will only be able to decrypt if it receives the master sequence um, the, the secret key from some master identity who owns the master secret key. 
So this was proposed in by Shamir in 1984, and it's been a very productive line in the cryptographic research community. What you need to remember for identity-based encryption and its security is that the main goal is to prove some kind of semantic security. There are generic techniques usually to achieve chosen ciphertext um, se um, security, so we focus on indistinguishability and the chosen plain text attacks. And this is essentially as in standard encryption, except that we give the adversary some additional power. Namely, we allow the adversary to request secret key ident secret key mm, the secret keys of our identities of his choice, and then adaptively choose a certain challenge identity. It's also possible to consider other more advanced uh, security features like anonymity, where the goal is to choose and um, to decide um, if a, for whom is a certain ciphertext. Um, this will not be the focus on, on this work, so I will explain mostly how to achieve this notion of CPA security. This is not proving in CPA security for IBE is not a simple thing. The reason is being that this adaptivity, so the fact that the adversary can choose the identity he wants to attack on the fly, this is something that is difficult to achieve. So if you think about it, the, the reduction must be able to answer secret key queries um, for any identity, and at the same time, he, it must also be able to embed a difficult problem in the challenge ciphertext. So this is something that is hard to... Um, mm, make uh, come together and this is why Luke and Waters suggested this dual system proof technique. The main thing to remember is that keys and ciphertext come in two different flavors. They are either functional as in the real scheme, so in the honest description of the scheme everything is functional, or semi-functional and this is a feature that only appears in the security proof. So I have used in this graphic um, um, green for functional and blue for semi-functional. And what you need to remember is that if I combine something that is semi-functional with something functional, so if I try to, if I have a certain ciphertext and I decrypt it with a functional key, so my ciphertext is has a functional and a semi-functional component, everything works normally. Okay? So semi-functional plus functional results, you, you won't notice a difference when you decrypt. However, if you match a semi-functional ciphertext with a semi-functional key, then you will recover your message plus a binding, some blinding factor, I don't really care, is some function of, um, which is a function of this, uh, the semi-functional component of the ciphertext and the semi-functional component of the secret key. I won't, uh, I don't care too much about what is a function. The, the point is that um, this is something that obscure the final, the, the, the result of decryption. So how do we use this for proving security? So in a, the idea is that in a series of games, we, see, we change everything that the adversary sees from functional to semi-functional. So in particular, all secret keys that the adversary sees are semi-functional and the challenge ciphertext will also be semi-functional. The important thing now is that in the final game, we have that all keys that the adversary sees have a semi-functional component, and in this semi-functional component, there is independent ram randomness, okay? So that the blinding factor, so the, the, the adversary has many keys and when he, if he tries to decrypt the challenge ciphertext with the, um, with the keys that he got, he will get um, blinding factors, but they will be all independent, so that he cannot really um, exploit anything. Um, so these keys are completely useless, and it's very easy to, to argue at this point that the adversary's view is completely independent of the encrypted plaintext. So the fundamental um, step that you have to remember for this talk is step two. So the idea that we want to switch um, to a game where all the keys have independent randomness in the semi-functional space, okay? 
So how does uh, we achieve this for proving security of his composite order Petit Tiber? So first I have to tell you something very, the basics of composite order bilinear groups and why they are so useful. As you know, a bilinear um, um, a bilinear group, there is there are like three groups, G, H, and the target group, and a bilinear map between them. And in this case, we have that the group order is N, which is a large integer, which is the product of two primes, and that N is large enough so that it is hard to find these this prime factors. Um, now, given that the, the comp order is um, composite, we have that there are non-trivial subgroups in G and H. So in particular, we can identify in G the group GP1 and GP2, which have respective orders P1 and P2, and, the, and in H the group HP1 and HP2. What is important to remember is that we have subgroup orthogonality, so that if we pair something that is in a subgroup um, of order P1 with something that is in a subgroup of order P2, P2, we get a trivial element. On the other hand, the other powerful feature is that we have a hidden subgroup assumption. So we have that we cannot distinguish if an element is in a subgroup or is in the full group. So how does this match with the dual um, proof technique? So the idea is that these uh, spaces, these dual spaces, will mm, correspond to subgroups. So the functional mm, subspace will be a, a certain subgroup of order P1 and the semi-functional we will put it in the group of subgroup of order P2. And the same for the secret key, but in H, because since we want to decrypt, we want to when we want to decrypt, we want to pair a ciphertext with the secret key. So we need to put these on one side of the pairing and the secret keys on the other side of the pairing. Now, why does this realize this idea that functional with semi-functional decrypts well, etc.? Well, because of orthogonality. So anytime I pair something that is functional with something that is semi-functional, it will cancel out because of orth subgroup orthogonality. On the other hand, if I pair something that is semi-functional with something semi-functional, I will get, this will not cancel out and I will get um, a blinding factor that will obscure my decryption. So now we move on to the, the key um, point in the technique. So how can we plug this independent randomness in the semi-functional key space? So for this, uh, we use the deja Q technique of Chase and Michael John. So the idea is that um, we repeat, it, repeat many times two steps. Um, one step, um, in one step, we use the subgroup hiding assumption. And what we do is we start with a functional key and using the subgroup hiding, we can plug in some copy of this key in the group of order P2. Um, this is called in later world the entropy injection uh, phase. Later, um, by the Chinese remainder theorem, we can argue that in fact um, information theoretically it's equivalent to the. Um, we can change these these keys in the semi-functional key um, space for another value of the master secret key. Why? Because um, the Chinese remainder theorem tells us that. Whatever you do modulo P1 is completely independent of what happens modulo P2. So you actually, um, here alpha is only leak modulo P1, here it's leak modulo P2. So of course you don't know if it's the same alpha or not. So if you we do repeat many times these two steps, we can keep changing and getting a different um, alpha in each in the semi-functional component at each step. So we move to, we end up with a sum um, of different, with different alphas in the semi-functional space. So now we, it's very easy to argue that the randomness is independent since um, this is a Q-wise independent function. So from the point of view of the adversary, this is the same as a truly random function. Can we do that in the prime order setting? So we will see the, mm, we will um, see how um, we try to do this in the um, 
prime order setting for proving the security of his candidate prime order ID. The first thing you have to know is that um, how can we emulate these hidden subgroups in prime order groups? So this is a very well-known technique and the idea is that um, the standard assumptions, including DDH or decisional linear, um, so standard assumptions like DDH or decisional linear can be used to emulate subgroup assumptions, hidden subgroup assumptions. In particular, we can generalize these assumptions to um, matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption as proposed to um, by Escala et al. at Crypto13. And the idea is that um, all these assumptions can be written in the following form. We have a matrix given in the group and we cannot distinguish if some certain vector is um, in the image of this matrix in the exponent or not. Okay. So our group um, G1 is now um, the image of some matrix. So we have that the functional space corresponds to the image of some matrix A, the functional space for the secret keys corresponding to the image of some matrix B. And now, remember, we want to have this orthogonality feature. So, of course, it makes sense to put the semi-functional space for the ciphertext in, some, some in the space generated by some vector B, which is orthogonal to the functional space of the secret keys. And the same for um, the semi-functional space for the keys. It should be in the space generated by some vector i, which is orthogonal to the functional space for the ciphertext. So this gives the, um, this motivates the prime order translation of we, so we have this functional space, it's translated in this way. The semi-functional space is, uh, corresponds to um, things that are in a certain um, space generated by one vector. And now for making dimensions match, what used to be the master secret key now becomes a matrix. Remember that this K um, is, this case is supposed to, is a, is a parameter that tells you how hard is your assumption. So if you are happy with using the Diffie-Hellman assumption, um, this K is equal one. So this would be your secret key in the simplest case is a two times two matrix. And now the secret keys, usually you would invert. So now you have to invert a certain matrix. So let's do some wishful thinking and think how we would use this deja queue technique um, for in the prime order setting. So the first thing is ob to observe, sorry, to observe that we definitely can um, do the first step and be a subspace hiding, um, make a copy of this uh, of this in, of this uh, key in the semi-functional space. Okay, because we can you can get a, a challenge and you don't know if it's in BU or you know or it has a component in in this space. And be a subspace hiding is very easy to make a copy of the key in the semi-functional space. And now we would like to argue similar as in the composite order case and say um, via that thanks to parameter hiding, we can chase this W by some W um, overline. If we could do that, we could repeat this many times and then we again we would get some sum here of Q terms and this is a Q-wise independent function and this would give me a random function in the semi-functional space. So the final question is um, do we have this parameter ha hiding in um, prime order? So in composite order our argument was that if I have G1 with this exponent this leaks nothing about the projection of um, one divided by alpha plus id on this other space. And our question now is, does this, so the projection on the functional space of this matrix, give me information about the um, projection on the non, um, on the semi-functional space? For this, we use, our main result comes from a linear algebra lemma that we prove, and we show that, um, 
the following. So if you have W is your secret key, uh, is your master secret key, and assume it can be diagonalized. And we have a basis of eigenvectors, which is F1, F K plus one, and alpha one, alpha K plus one are the eigenvalues. What we show is that if R are the coordinates of BU in this basis, so this is a basis, so this R are just the coordinates that express BU in these terms, we have this very simple expression. We have that this thing, which is the secret key, is a sum of from I1 to K plus 1 of the coordinates divided by the eigenvectors plus ID times the eigenvalues. So we have this simple form. So we have the expression of the secret keys in terms of eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the secret key. So we show using this formula, it's easy to see that there is no parameter hiding in the general case. So what do we mean in the general case? So assume that Ri is not zero for all uh, i from 1 to k plus 1. We call this general case because um, if you sample b and w independently, r will be non-zero most of the cases, right? So in this case, there is easy to see that there is a, an, an unbounded algorithm that re recovers the eigenvalues. It doesn't really matter to understand the details, but um, the idea is that you can make a guess and then obviously, if you guess the right uh, eigenvalues, you will be able to cancel this denominator. And then you, what you will get is that the, sec the secret keys uh, multiplied by this, this will form a polynomial of degree k. You have many keys, so of course you can test this. You can test that if you multiply them by this value, if they end up um, by interpolation, if they, are, they form a polynomial of degree k. Um, note that this is an unbounded algorithm because we are arguing about an information theoretic property, so we don't care that the algorithm is unbounded. Bottom line, it doesn't matter um, if you understood this, but the bottom line is that um, if Ri is not zero, we can recover all the eigenvalues. And in by a simple um, arguments about linear systems, we can also recover the eigenvectors. Okay? So... And obviously, if we have the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, we can recover all of the W. So, which means that if all the Ri are non-zero, we have no parameter zero, no parameter hiding. So, do we have hope? So, what happens if some Ri is zero? Then, obviously, this does not leak all information about um, W since some alpha I is hidden. Um, so, in particular, we could think what happens if we choose that B is a k-dimensional space. Remember, B is a column, is a k-dimensional space, and these are k vectors of dimension k plus one, um, formed by the eigen eigen uh, vectors. Then, of course, there would be some information about uh, W that would be hidden, namely the 8K plus 1 um, eigenvalue. Unfortunately, this would solve the problem that we have parameter hiding, but this is not compatible with plugging in a decisional assumption um, in B. Huh? So the issue is that we need W to compute the secret keys. On the other hand, if we want to use um, B, uh, as a decisional assumption, we cannot have um, the um, the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors in the exponent. In conclusion, if B is a matrix generating the subgroup, and and W are chosen independently, um, we don't have parameter hiding. If they are chosen to depend on each other, then we run into a difficult problem because we don't know how to simulate secret keys. Um, so in, we don't think that uh, this has a solution and there, we think there is no translation of the deja Q um, technique in the prime order setting. 
Obviously, this does not prove that the scheme of we is not secure, but the most interesting part was to prove it secure under standard assumptions. In summary, the tale is told, the grief is shared, and although you might still not be wiser, our hearts said certainly feel lighter. So thank you very much for listening to this talk. Nice. Uh, also very nicely celebrated. <laughs> thank you for the talk. I have I to say it's quite painful to watch yourself record it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's normal. I don't see any questions in the Seafell chat. Now, I don't see any questions here on Zoom. We are a small enough audience that people can unmute if they want to ask questions. But let me start by, well, why is this a failure? Because you want to show it secure or because? Um, yeah, well, well, it's, um, well, it certainly, I have to start with the subjective part and it certainly felt like a failure. <laughs> So, and this is true what I said that this was a long time ago because um, we had this Javier and Zaira were starting the PhD. We invested a lot of energy and trying to, to get this uh, result and it didn't, it didn't work. Um, so it, it is a success in the sense that it, it solves the open question left. Um, so we had, a, he, he said, okay, I propose this uh, prime order translation. And he also said, I know parameter hiding doesn't doesn't work if the matrix W is diagonal, but I don't know what happens otherwise. No, so it, it's it's solved. The, so this solves the the problem, but um, yeah, but it, for sure it felt like a fail. I mean, it would be actually a, a very nice thing because uh, there's plenty of schemes that use these Q assumptions and like the only so to to use this like sort of Bonnet Boyen type of um, signature in the secret key, and all of them need Q assumptions to be proven. No, so it would be like really nice if you'd have something like that. And this looks like um, that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, but then understanding that it can't work this way is also a success. At least it's very insightful. Yes, um, for sure. But like maybe for the PhD students who are starting the thesis, if you don't cannot publish it, it's, uh, it, it, uh, it feels like a yeah. failure. Yeah. Um, also, I think failure is relative to the amount of time that you spend, right? If like, uh, if you spend like your afternoon and you're like, oh, it doesn't work, then you're happy to, it doesn't matter, no? But like, um, and in, in retrospective, it's also like super, it's actually very simple, in fact, why the, like the correct, this algebraic characterization is like a is a very simple uh, linear algebra trick, so it it shouldn't have been that hard. But we spent like really a lot of time thinking about this. Like, mm -hmm. oh, and could we said now? It's like it's very obvious that. Do we have like, any well, I guess it's, this is true for everything, right? Like failures and no, success. Retrospective, you're like, why? What, what was so hard about that? So. I have a question. I yeah. Um, uh, so, so this was this was for a very like particular form of a linear transformation, right? That you're sort of assuming that like same format of the RI over the alpha plus uh, ID. Do you think that there might be a generalization of this to general sort of linear transformations, or do you think that there might be a possibility to sort of tweak that format? I I. I um... No, I, I, I think it, you can generalize it. So, um, so here, what you use really for this lemma is you use the fact that, uh, so that you have W plus ID times the identity matrix. And what you use is that the identity, everything is an eigenvector of the identity matrix. And that's it. Um, so, I think more generally, like intuitively, anything that is in general form tends to leak because you have so many keys. And then, no, and then again, you pro I think you, more generally, you could have that any, that if you need a dependence between the, the, the decisional assumption and the key, this looks like a, 
a difficult problem. So of course, the, the, the concrete form of leakage, um, the, the, the function really uses the, the, the form, but like the principal idea, I think it will be similar. That would be my gut too. It just seems like kind of a pain to like formulate it in the abstract, but yeah, it seems it seems like it would it would generalize. Yeah. Well, in IBE, like I focus on the on the secret part and the secret key, right? But like, um, well, on top of this, you also have it to have W on the other side of the pairing somehow. So mm -hmm. it makes it like you really need it in the exponent. Um, so it's it seems like I don't know um, difficult. Like once, since really, like the, I had to refresh it in my mind because I had forgotten everything about it. So this time I was again thinking like, oh, but maybe, you know, but then I was like, again, like that's convinced. But it gets you every time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I assume that both talks are supposed to be the same length. So I think we should move on. But thank yep. you very much for your talk. Another virtual or semi-audible applause. <laughs> <laughs>